Um, it's a great pleasure and an honor. And I wanted also to add that I, I feel very privileged being at the uh, uh, University of California, Irvine, only 20 minutes away from Chapman, as there is such uh, great energy, both in the math department, physics. And I recently also found out about uh, the, quant the Center for Quantum Information and, and um, with great connections to what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, although what I'm going to be talking about is rather classical. Um, connects more to classical thermodynamics. So uh, the subject is uh, stochastic thermodynamic engines. And this is a, a, um, a, a, I would say a very recent subject, it's an extremely exciting subject, has a history of about 20 years and it's developing very rapidly. It's, it's a, a, um, a proper marriage of stochastic control perhaps and thermodynamics to answer certain questions about non-equilibrium thermodynamics that, that have um, a very long history. So this is, this is a collage that brings in Carnot cycle, thermal engines and processes, underscores the significance of optimization and control. And there is over there a, a uh, bulldozer which signifies optimal mass transport. There is a serendipitous connection with the subject of optimal mass transport, which I've been working for several years. This is a... Uh, also another collage of um, some of the giants of the field that created the subject, starting from Carnot. And perhaps I don't know how many of you remember the history, but Carnot died at a very young age. He only published a book, which he published with his own money. It was a, a, a research monograph, uh, a very simple research monograph that basically started the whole field. It's amazing how much came out of that, out of a Gedanken basic experiment, where uh, the basic concept was uh, quasi-static processes. And um, he died at a very young age of cholera. And then the book came to the hands of Clausius, the second the picture, and the rest is history. Uh, some of the names you may recognize there, Boltzmann, Gibbs, Shannon, and the last one is Landauer in the 60s that came up with uh, certain ideas that connect in a very, very strong way. And we'll talk a little bit about that, thermodynamics with information theory. So uh, I will give you a couple of slides, some very ins insights and puzzles, uh, more as a teaser and some uh, to, to remind you of the origins of, of the subject. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, thermodynamic energetics, how uh, this new subject started where you can define uh, energy transfer and work at the level of individual particles and uh, um, the uh, stochastic, uh, uh, stochastic control becomes very relevant. Uh, the mathematics is going to be a bit rudimentary for the most part. Uh, then I'll connect with optimal mass transport. This is a serendipitous connection that brings the geometry to the subject. And this is absolutely beautiful. And we're going to see some things at the very end. Then we'll transition to, uh, these are some vignettes and a, a sequence of ideas, how they build on uh, this idea of why information is really physical and bit erasure and Landau's bound, thermodynamic transitions in finite times. We're going to see a quantitative way of, of expressing dissipation using uh, optimal mass transport. And, with these tools under our belts, we'll talk about harvesting energy in Carnot-like engines, periodic heat baths, and so and so forth. And then I'll, I'll conclude with some future directions. A very dynamic subject and a, a rather beautiful one. So classical thermodynamics was born out of the, this idea of how you would like to quantify efficiency and uh, how you get work out of thermal baths. So you see at the very top here, you have, this is a Carnot cycle and you get uh, Q designates heat, H designates the hot heat bath. So the, the substance is, uh, the engine is in contact with a, a, a heat bath of some high temperature and then draws heat out of that. There is a leakage to the cold heat bath and along the way, some of this is, is translated into work. The basic idea of Carnot, which was absolutely brilliant and, and 
we inherited from that tons of ideas, including entropy, the existence of absolute temperature, and so forth in the second law of thermodynamics, is to study reversible quasi-static processes. So all the transitions were done infinitely slowly. And then the ultimate result that he was driving at was the efficiency, the Carnot efficiency, which was like the Holy Grail. Um, and um, that was the beginning. Now, of course, a static operation is fine when you, you look at um, efficiency, but because the cycling is the period is infinite, you draw zero power. So there has been a lot of work and a lot of work is still in progress to try to quantify how much efficiency you get for how much power you draw. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Another big puzzle uh, came up with another Gedankian experiment by Maxwell and underlies a number of uh, puzzles going on to today. Uh, the Feynman, uh, famous Feynman ratchet uh, uh, experiment. So here, this, this uh, setting exemplifies the, the idea of Maxwell that you have a demon here, a, a creature that is very intelligent and opens and closes a, a um, a passage here between two parts of the container because of um, particles having um, a distribution of velocities allows the hot particles to go on one end and, and uh, slow particles to go on, uh, on the other. And by in this way generates a gradient from which you can draw work out of this. And of course the question is, how does it do it? Uh, so this uh, is, is um, it was debated for almost a hundred years before the, the recent consensus with the Landauer's uh, uh, principle that there is a cost in, in processing information. So then we, we come to the point where there's various uh, models for explaining, understanding all of this. Um, there are, um, uh, different kinds of engines trying to um, what's called into reversible engines I'm not going to talk about trying to find the efficiency and performance and so on in the 50s 60s and so forth and we come to the late 90s early 2000s uh, Landau of course is, was much earlier uh, with different fluctuation theorems and uh, uh, stochastic thermodynamics and the key names here Sekimoto, Seifer, Lutz and fluctuation theorems, Crookes, Zarzinski, and earlier Evans, Cohen, Morris, and, and several others. And the, this comes to the point where the technology allows us to manipulate uh, uh, particles at the size of uh, you know, 100 angstroms or more or less uh, micro manipulation, nano manipulations with uh, optical tweezers. You can stretch DNA strands and you can ask the question how much work you're going to do. And you can uh, contemplate um, studying biological engines exactly how, for example, uh, different proteins walk, the kinesin molecules, how uh, biological processes draw uh, energy out of. Uh, chemical differentials and potentials and so on. And, and this, all this theory comes exactly at the time that the technology catches up and experiments are there to verify some of the findings. Of course, the jury is still out on many things. Now, I'll talk a little bit about Landauer's uh, idea. And Landauer, uh, you know, the, for a long time, the, the issue was for Maxwell's demon, uh, how does Ma the, the demon get work out of that? Is it the, the act of, um, of, of uh, measuring that has, is needed to be thought out to restore the second law? But it turns out what, and this is the consensus now, that restoring the second law uh, comes because the uh, processing information and actually raising information has a energetic cost. And Landauer, uh, quantified that the energetic cost for erasing one bit of information is KBT, depends on the temperature that you erase the bit, KB is the Boltzmann constant, log two. And I'm going to talk briefly about that as a prelude to what is coming. So uh, the schematic here, you're going to see it in a moment. 
again. So stochastic thermodynamics, um, uh, the, the premise of this is that you can manipulate individual atoms that are or, or ensembles of, of particles that are, are located, and this has the, their probability distributions inside some, some potential. And you manipulate the potential, and by doing that, you put energy or draw energy out of the ensemble in order to bring the distribution from one endpoint to another. And you do thermodynamics at the level of single particles. Uh, then you can study fi finite uh, time transitions. There's a beautiful book by Sekimoto and a beautiful article by Cypher that uh, summarize the, the basics of this. And here I'm going to discuss the sort of the basic model, which is a rudimentary Langevin dynamics um, and Orsten Ullenbeck. Um, so here you have the position and velocity, and then the change in momentum is driven by a potential, which is your control. So U is a potential. Lambda is a, is a function of time. Uh, for example, like the spring constant. Pretty soon, we'll just replace this with T. And X is the position of a particle. Gamma is a friction coefficient. And here is the thermal excitation with the, um, the, the um, Einstein's expression for the the um, the, uh, the fluctuation, which depends on the temperature and the, um, the friction. The temperature here, in general, we're going to make it time varying. And here's the Fokker-Planck equation. Uh, We lost the sound. It looks uh, frozen. Yes, we have a case of a frozen speaker right now. So we're, we're going to have to wait for him to come back to us <laughs> on the frozen uh, wastelands of Greece. <laughs> OK. So connectivity issues all around today. OK. We even had a, a, a crash into one of the special sessions. The computer crashed, but the, the session went on. OK, so we're going to have to wait. Okay. Let me pause the recording. The, the, the recording and uh, let, 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 me try, let me try to try, try the other one, just in case it's, it's a little bit better. I think it's. We can, we can hear you. Oh, no, yeah. So, the screen is fine. Uh, no, it's frozen now. Frozen? Oh. You see, just just look at just look at Rifon's face. Definitely frozen. Yes. Ah. Oh. So I, I explained that there was um there was the underdamp dynamics and there is the overdamp dynamics, second order and first order dynamics. Now the interesting thing here that we're going to see again. Is for this is the uh, the um, the overdamped, so it's a first order stochastic differential equation, and the Fokker Planck can be written as a continuity equation when the the v over here is absorbing the the gradient of the logarithm of the rho. Now the way you um, you set up in order to be able to talk about work uh, when you you uh, deal with an ensemble. Uh, you can define, and this has been debated quite a bit, and it looks very okay. No? Oh. Is this okay? Now it's okay. Okay, yes. That's good, yeah. But now it's not. Oh, so when you, you, when you manipulate, with a with potential, a, a, an individual particle, the partial derivative of the potential with respect to time gives you the, the work. So the rate with which work is accumulated is like this. And when you have an ensemble, the expected value, so you integrate against the, the distribution and you get the work. So calligraphic W designates uh, sort of average quantities and this is the individual particle. So during an interval, 
this integral represents how much work you get out of a single particle, then you can start talking about rare events and large deviations and so on. And this is the average quantity. The total energy is the potential plus the kinetic energy. And this is averaged again. And the first law says that the, the heat and the heat is all the exchange of energy between the, the friction forces and the stochastic excitation. And having that under the back under uh, our belt, we can do some computations. For example, uh, the entropy of the system, you can define entropy at the level of individual particle. And so this is the log rho, and, and this is an average entropy. So log rho, the position of it is almost like an interaction potential could be thought of as the entropy of a single particle as it sits inside a cloud. And, and this is the entropy of the system. The free energy, is the difference between the entropy, the 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 uh, energy of the system, the energy is the integral of uh, rho against the potential, and uh, kbt kb translates units uh, into uh, numbers into ener energetic. So the the uh, it takes care of the the proper uh, um, the the entropy. Now, if you free energy, the free energy, those of you who are not familiar with that, it's really the kullback liber divergence, relative entropy between the rho and the Boltzmann distribution for the corresponding temperature. So this has a very nice interpretation. It's just really the relative entropy. Now, when you take the time derivative of the free energy, the physicists will explain to you as if this is the energy, the, the work that you can get out of the system. If you take the derivative of that, it is a simple computation. Um, and then if you replace over here, the partial of rho with respect to T with the Fokker-Planck equation that we saw in the previous uh, expression, you get that the derivative of free energy is uh, this expression that has to do with the, the work. And uh, here you have a negative expression which has to do with dissipation. And this is extremely interesting. Uh, this is extremely interesting, and it is the expected value of the quadratic expression. So this quadratic expression is V for the overdamped and, and takes some different expression for the underdamped case. Integrating over time, you get basically the second law, that the work that you get out of the system uh, is, is greater than, uh, or you put into the system is greater than change in the free energy. And what remains here, is a term which is goes to wasted, so to speak, and this is dissipation. Now, there is a, a serendipitous connection with another subject, which is absolutely beautiful, and the subject is called optimal mass transport. And we're going to see exactly the same equation that we saw a minute ago. It goes back to Gaspar Monge, who, who wanted to move a pile of rubble to fill in some holes, uh, a famous mathematician, um, um, one of the founders of uh, called Polytechnic, and he came up with this idea when he was working as an engineer in Napoleon's army. And the subject drew many mathematicians, and it was a very tricky uh, problem, uh, resolved to some degree by Leonid Kantorovich, who got the Nobel Prize for the work because it has tremendous implications in, in econometrics. So Monge's formulation was to move a mass from one to another. These are uh, probability measures, uh, if you like. A and the push forward of mu is uh, nu. Um, and the cost is x moves to t of x. So he was looking for the t. t is not a temperature. Here is, here is a map. And it's a very nonlinear problem. Now, uh, Kantorovich came up with a brilliant idea. He said, forget about t try to uh, uh, look into a product space. So you have a distribution here in the space X, and here you have another distribution space Y, and you look at the product space for some distribution here, such as the marginals in the, in the direction X give you one, and the marginals in the direction of Y gives you the other. So he's looking for a coupling between the two measures, that's pi is a coupling, so the, the integral in one direction gives you one distribution and the other gives you the other. Most of the times, everything will be absolutely continuous and I'm talking about densities, but you can talk about measures. That becomes a linear program. And that 
uh, of course, drew a number of people and was very useful for many years. And we come to the 90s, we have a brilliant idea, and the idea is as follows. So I'm talking about the Wasserstein two distance. The, the, the cost is the quadratic cost, because that's what's important in physics. If you look at uh, a path between two points in the Euclidean space, and you try to penalize the, the velocity of a particle that moves from here to there, the integral of the velocity along all possible curves, the, the optimal curve is a straight line traversed with constant velocity. That's trivial. And therefore, the, the, the quadratic distance between the endpoints is given by this complicated expression. So let's move back here. The expression in Kantorovich's formulation has a cost that has to do with where you move from where to where. So if you replace in here this complicated expression, what you get is a, a stochastic control formulation of the optimal mass transport. So what you have is you look at, you minimize over the distribution, the velocity, a, uh, satisfying the continuity equation and the marginals, the two marginals at two endpoints in time. This came up in some work of Benham and Brenier that were looking to find efficient ways of computing the optimal transport. Now, this, this problem is absolutely brilliant because what you have here, you have an action integral in the style of physics. You have expected value of kinetic energy linking two distributions, two endpoints. So again, this is a rewrite, and that expression is known under, as the Wasserstein distance. Here you could have measures, but you have densities as well. And um, it's simply uh, a, a kinetic energy. It's a control problem. You minimize the average kinetic energy that matches the two distributions. So you can look at it in a probabilistic way. You're looking for a law on, on the path space. You have two distributions of particles, beginning and end. And you're looking at all possible trajectories of particles. And you want a law on the, the path space that minimizes that. All of those problems are identical. Now, this is one slide, you're not going to see it. I just want to, to, it's more like to whet the appetite. There's a beautiful Riemannian geometry on the space of distributions. Uh, it's, it's due to Otto Kindler, e Otto, primarily, it's called Otto Calculus. Uh, probability densities, let's talk about densities, it's not going to measures, are uh, integrate to one. So the tangents are perturbations that integrate to zero. Think of them as functions. They could be on manifolds on, 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 on Euclidean spaces. Now, the brilliant idea is to uh, make a correspondence between points in the tangent space, namely perturbations, and uh, velocities that um, satisfy this Poisson equation. So this is like incremental change in the, this direction delta. So you, are, you, you make a correspondence between uh, a perturbation of the density and a vector field. And there, the, um, the, the inner product is between, let's say, there's two perturbations around the point rho. Rho is a density. So you think of densities. It's, this is the um, uh, space of densities. Um, they have to have a second moment, finite second moment. A, and here on the right hand side, you have basically kinetic energy. So you look at the velocities uh, that correspond to these two perturbations and you take the inner product there. That gives you, uh, makes it into a geodesic space and the geodesic distance is the Wasserstein distance and you can do a lot of calculus there. So I just have one more slide to kind of whet the appetite for those who haven't seen it. And this is a very famous uh, result of Jordan Kindler and Otto 1998 where they show that the, the heat equation, so this Laplacian here, is nothing more than a gradient flow of the entropy in the Wasserstein calculus, in the autocalculus. And, and there's an expression for that. So you can trace all of it in your product and everything. You can write the, the gradient in this way. This is absolutely beautiful because it brings the heat equation, optimal transport, entropy in the same page. And this is what sits underneath what we were just been discussing. 
So I'm going to go back to it. So, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about dissipation and moving a, a, an ensemble of particles from one point to another. So here we come to the, the uh, discussing the Landauer uh, uh, resolution of the puzzle of, um, uh, of asking how much do you need in order to uh, do some computation? How much work do you need to do some computation? So he pinned down the cost of the computation in the erasure of a bit. What is an erasure of a bit? The bit is a flip-flop that sits either here or there. It's a zero or one. So it represents a bimodal system. So you have a, a, a potential that has two wells and the particle sits either on the left or on the right. So uh, erasure means that you move the particle, whatever it is, you move it on one side. So you erase the information. So how do you erase information? Here is how you erase information. If the particle is at this, the point one, you change the potential in such a way it remains at the first point. If it was in the position here, in the, the other position, you keep the potential so the particle goes back there. And you do all of this uh, with some, some cost because the particle is, is excited by a heat bath. And uh, you can compute, he, that's what he did, the theoretical lower bound on the work for the computation, if you have no restriction on time, is KBT log two. That was uh, the famous Landauer bound. But now you can do the same thing, and there have been several works, and we're the ones connected with the Wasserstein distance, where again, you have a bimodal distribution and you would like to force it to become unimodal with a suitable control action here. And you can do that and you can compute that the work needed is the change in the free energy. The free energy has to do with the initial distribution and the final distribution. And there is a part which is irreparably lost. And this has to do with the duration and the length of the path of the densities in the Wasserstein space. So the densities are going to follow a certain uh, mixed distribution until they, they rest at the final end to a unimodal. So this is exactly the restores the cost on the second law. The second law tells, tells you that there is this relationship between the change in the free energy and the work uh, done. If you are doing a finite time transitions, then you have the wasted work can be at least when the model is the overdamped dynamics can be expressed in this way. There are certain other um, directions we're not going to talk about of uh, fluctuation dissipation. Uh, this is the famous Zinsky equation that restores the second law uh, touching upon large deviation events. I will not have the time to talk about this. In the moment that you observe the system, you have, again, a other expressions you restore again you can have the waste energy coming on the right hand side but you have other terms which have to do with work that you can gain out of information so i'm not going to talk about this but it's a whole new chapter and a whole lecture both of those so the the moral of the story so far is that dissipation can be quantified with some length and then we're going to see this length in the space of distributions metrized with a Wasserstein metric. Now we're talking about, uh, we, we turn into harvesting energy from various contraptions. So Carnot's contraption, and this is an exam, exa, exa, example of this, is where you have a, a, a distribution of particles, for example, that sit quietly and nicely a, under the influence of a heat bath of some temperature TH, inside some potential, and the distribution is a Boltzmann distribution, for example, then you open up the potential, you relax the spring constant, and the distributions opens up, and then you gain work out of it. Then you can go, uh, you can do an instantaneous transition, and at the same time, you bring the, the, the ensemble in contact with the cold heat bath, and now you put work into it, to bring it back to the initial point, 
and then you uh, close the cycle. So you can contemplate clockwise cyclic operation. You have isothermal transi transitions one and three. So the, here is in contact with a hot heat bath. Here is a cold heat bath, H and, and C. And then you have adi adiabatic transitions going uh, vertically. So that's exactly that blown up. So you have a potential that controls the spread of the distribution and you can go through the mechanics of quantifying dissipation and work that you can get out of it. So you, you can calculate the energy budget going around the cycle. And I'm going to go a little bit fast here. You take the derivative of the free energy and then you substitute here the Fokker-Planck equation. You uh, manipulate terms, you get here the reversible loss and you, here you have the work that you can get out of this. And when the dust clears, you have the change in the free energy, you have work, uh, the, the, the dissipation loss. The dissipation loss, the minimum dissipation loss is the Wasserstein distance between the two endpoint distributions divided by the duration, here's the square. It's an optimal mass transport problem. And uh, the, the, you can do budget in the isothermal transitions as well. Adiabatic, you have abrupt changes in the temperature and the R doesn't have time to change. So the entropy stays the same. Um, and again, you have no exchange of heat. So when, again, the dust uh, settles, you, you can compute the work that you extract and the heat here you draw from the heat bath, the hot heat bath, and you do the calculations, you see what the efficiency is. When the time goes to infinity for the cycle, you recover Carnot efficiency. And this is the beautiful expression of Carnot. One minus the difference between cold and hot temperatures, absolute temperatures. Uh, for finite transitions, it's, it's more complicated and it's exactly this expression. So you have um, the TH and TC come here but you have the change of the entropy between the two endpoints and you have the Wasserstein distance. Now you can ask, how do you optimize all this? So you can, you can optimize power. And earlier work focused on Gaussian distributions and we can do it in general for general distributions. And uh, because time is running very quickly, I have something very exciting to tell you. I'm going to speed up. So if you fix the TH and TC, you can optimize power over everything. Uh, this is basically calculus of variations, and you can get expressions for the power. And of course, this reduces to zero if the T cycle goes to infinity, and you can get uh, interesting expressions. And um, you can look at other fundamental limits when you have limitations on the resolution with which you dictate the shape of that, because various um, physical limitations. And you can get expressions that involve similar things like Carnot, ratio of the temperatures. And you can also talk about maximal efficiency, efficiency at maximal power. When you draw maximal power, what is the efficiency you can draw? And, and this connects with a body of work uh, now um, under different assumptions. And I just want to very, uh, uh, right here that this is a Carnot efficiency that's unbeatable and it is uh, this. There are different kinds of efficiency and the different assumptions. Curzon Alphorn is a famous one um, and uh, it has to do with the, the, the ratio of the square roots of those as computed by under certain assumptions and the reversible engines. And uh, all of these are very similar and you can draw some physical insights of this. Now, let me uh, have two slides. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of some results, but um, again, just to excite the imagination, um, the model of bringing a heat, a, an engine in contact with a hot heat bath and a cold heat bath is very idealistic. In real life, you may have changes in the, in the heat bath. The sun rises and the sun sets. You can have um, 
biological processes where the, the, the chemical potential fluctuates. So it's an interesting question to find out what happens if you have a temperature which is uh, periodic. And you can think of the potential or whatever the metabolic processes uh, uh, tune in to draw energy out of uh, the ambient uh, space and temperature uh, tune in. And the question is how does the temperature profile affect the maximum, the limits on power, and of course efficiency that you can draw out of this. And again, you can bring in stochastic thermodynamics, the, the premises that we had before and the assumptions, you can do different approximations over damped, under damped limits, and the objective is to maximize power. Under the assumption that we have um, quadratic potential, so or you have here, uh, the, the potential is qx squared. So when you take the gradient, you have a spring constant, then we can do the computations and you can get beautiful closed form expressions where the power that you can draw is limited by the variance of the temperature. And for the overdamped and for the underdamped, you have interesting the variance of the square root of the temperature. Now, many of those things remain to be interpreted properly. And, and the meaning of physical meaning is, is uh, the jury is still out because experiments are being done uh, on various uh, settings on that and to see how close uh, these predictions are. Um, now, I would like to move in to another, uh, uh, the, the third subject, harvesting energy from anisotropic fluctuations. This is much closer to what happens in the biological world. And it, um, it touches on, on a very interesting subject it's called Brownian gyrator. It relates to the, the ratchets, the famously popularized and, and thought by Feynman. And uh, uh, I would like to explain you the picture that you see here on the right. And to explain that the, the maximum power becomes a, a isoperimetric problem. So here is an example of a gyrator so that you see physically what it means. This is from a paper of Chiang et al. And some of the ideas uh, are, are earlier in Fillinger and Ryman um, of generating a microscopic uh, heat engines. So here you have two resistors. One of them is hot and the other is cold and you have Nyquist-Johnson thermal noise. So this, the model for this, if you write down the equations, you have uh, two uh, voltages, V1 and V2. And you have, because of the, the different difference in the capacitances, you have basically a potential which is slanted as compared to the sources of stochastic excitation. So uh, you're going to see, so intuitively what happens is you get some excitation on this side and a slower excitation on that side. And because of the, the, um, this contraption, you end up getting a stationary distribution. This is a Gaussian distribution. This is a second order system. It's a second order system. This is like a X dot Y dot, right? Is equal A X Y plus B. And then you have um, a white noise or, or Brownian motion if you want to like write stochastic. So you're going to get a steady state. The steady state is a Gaussian distribution, but the particles, undergo a rotation. You are not in equilibrium. It's stationary, but it's not in equilibrium. So they, they can exert torque. And this was postulated that you can use this to gain work out of it. So this is exactly the model. You have two sources of noise. They're independent. One is this, the hot, and here is the cold. And if you follow a particle, the particle goes into a circular motion. Now, you can, what you can do is you can change the potential with some spring constant 
and, and uh, trying to gain work out of that. Because the particles have a tendency to rotate, you rotate the potential with it. And this is exactly what we're doing. So the state of the system now is going to be a covariance. This is the covariance of the position of the particles. And it's time varying. Now, the spring constant, um, you see here, because you have, a, 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 you have basically a Lapunov equation. So the covariance sigma dot is going to be a sigma plus sigma a transpose plus bb transpose. Okay. So the a here is the k because that's a spring constant. So our, you know, the, the, the potential here is, is a quadratic. So the, the, the a matrix is really the k. And uh, now we can eliminate the k by replacing with a sigma dot. Because if you have the, the Lyapunov equation, you have sigma dot is equal k sigma plus sigma k transpose, right? Transpose here plus bb transpose, right? I can solve for k as a function of sigma. So I, I can make it uh, much more compact. Because I, I, if I know the sigma dot, the velocity I would like my particles to move, I can compute the k using this expression. So therefore, I can express everything in this, uh, this parameter space and the sigma, just to simplify matters, uh, we choose a characteristic length and we take the determinant of sigma to be constant. Um, so then it's going to be a rotational matrix times a diagonal matrix of the variances in the two directions. And uh, we can express now the sigma under those assumptions with a, a and r. This is like a radius that gives you the this how slanted the ellipse is, okay. and a theta, which has to be how it's rotated with respect to the temperatures. And this is our thermodynamic manifold. These are the parameters of our thermodynamic manifold. So. Um, we're going to be moving in this thermodynamic manner. So this is the distance r from the origin, and this is the theta. And every point here corresponds to a certain steady state expression for the, the, the station, the distribution, if you want to stay there. But we're not going to stay there. We're going to be moving, and the distribution is going to be rotated and slanted and turned around. And here is, for example, a cycle we're going to be making. So we're going to rotate around and then compress and return to, to point zero. And we're going to do energetics around this. So this is very simple. The energy in the system is, the potential energy is this. You can try to do uh, heat and work. The moment you try to put a sigma dot in there, because we replace the K with sigma dot, you end up with, a, a, a differential for the heat that involves sigma dot, and here sigma dot squared. The sigma dot squared is the dissipation. This is the quasi-static. It doesn't depend, depend on how slowly you traverse the cycle. So we are now checking how we're traversing cycles inside our, 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 um, our um, thermodynamic manifold. And this is the heat that is being exchanged. The two pieces, the quasi-static and the dissipation can be expressed very nicely in terms of the, the R and the phi, the, the angle, here is the phi, and here is the R. So whichever point you are here corresponds to a certain uh, potential, which is the position of the capacitors and so on, that gives you a certain stationary distribution. You don't stay in the stationary distribution, you keep moving. And you keep moving and you can gain energy out of this. The quasi-static uh, heat is written like that. And over a cycle, it's zero using Stokes theorem. You can write it as a, a curl integrated over the domain. And then we come to the uh, setting where we have the dissipation can be written. That, now, this is the other term. This is the dissipation that has the sigma squared. When you have the sigma squared here, you have r dot squared and phi dot squared. And this is basically 
the the um, the quadratic or the velo velocity field in a suitable metric, and that is the metric. So our our uh, thermodynamic manifold becomes a Riemannian manifold with this metric, and the dissipation is greater than the square of the, the this this expression, right? This is the square, which becomes equal to you can take the square here outside if you traverse it with constant speed. So it's a constant speed geodesic. If you don't accelerate and decelerate, you don't waste too much energy and you go around and this is the minimal and it's achievable. And therefore you come to this expression where the work out becomes the area integral minus the length squared. That's the length of the curve and the integral of a density uh, uh, with respect to the, uh, actually here, this is the metric, right? I mean, th there's a density in the metric, they're all grouped together. And this, these parameters here are, are um, normalized and they are very natural parameters. This is a characteristic length, characteristic time and so on. So this becomes an isoperimetric problem and you can write these expressions and you can write efficiency in terms of, um, again, uh, it depends on how you, you draw it. And the area of a lambda square, you can, you can show that um, is achieved for an infinitesimal cycle uh, around the point where the drawing is maximal. Um, and uh, for different, uh, this mu, these are the parameters that come here and they're natural physical, they can be given some physical interpretation in terms of the, the difference of the temperature of the, the two excitation sources. And you can see how the, the optimal work out of it gives you a curve of this type depending on the mu. Uh, the optimal efficiency is, is, um, is achieved. At, at the tip here. So here, this is a, a plot of the thermodynamic manifold, color codec, the density that you need to integrate that gives you work out of it. And um, with that, I come to the end. I um, will allow some, a lot more time for discussion. It's, it's a very exciting subject. Um, and um, again, this, this the discussion that I had at the very end is of a very, uh, specific normalization, but it's natural. And you can do it in, in, in uh, higher dimensions as well, very similarly. So we discussed Carnot-like cycles, heat engines with uh, varying temperature profiling, you can quantify maximum power that can be drawn out of it and, 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 um, and uh, efficiency. Uh, I didn't talk much about updated law, second law, when you bring in the the, 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 the benefit of information in, I haven't spoken about that. BT Razor was, was uh, something that got us started. And then the final point was on isotropic fluctuations. Again, I would like to stop to, to underscore this because anisotropic fluctuations appear everywhere. You have stationary uh, or non-stationary out of equilibrium processes that are excited by different excitation sources. And all of this plays exactly into the tools and the setting that we're all, we are very familiar and we love. Like for example, I mentioned the Puno equation, optimal control. It's all hidden in there. And robustness, how does perturbation in the model affect continuity of the, the, the results that uh, you know, we, 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 um, we are discussing. Closed loop control. I talked about only open loop control. You, you choose the potential to follow something now and to draw power out of it. Uh, what if you have measurements? And of course, cost of computation and to build the whole circuit theory on thermodynamical systems. So there is, the, there is a lot that is going to, um, um, it, it, it's 20 years of research uh, my research team has started um, in the last five, eight years on this. And these are some of the people behind the work. Olga is my PhD student. Amir was a postdoc and he's starting at uh, 
uh, at University of Washington in Seattle in about a month. Uh, Rui uh, was my PhD student and she's back in China um, uh, for, uh, selecting a suitable university. She has some choices. And Yongxin Chen, former student of mine, he's a professor at uh, Georgia Tech. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and to acknowledge NSF and Air Force support. Um, and I'll return to the recap and conclusions. And I hope I gave you some, some idea of uh, a, a rather exciting area in a recent one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker. Are there any questions online? First, please unmute your mic if you have any questions. I have a quick question. Uh, at the beginning of the Brown and Guy Radar, uh, it's a system uh, of stochastic branch equation. And the first term, the stochastic in the first one is bound in motion, and, and in the second one is dv. And uh, dv, a copy of bound in motion, and what are, how they correlated. So, sorry, how? Uh, how are the two stochastic terms dv and dv? How are they? These, these are independent brown and motions. So they, they're independent, okay. Yeah, yeah, independent. So what, you have the stochastic what's the, what, what's mm -hmm. the justification for that assumption? Because this is the basically the heat source for one capacity for one resistor, and this is the heat source for the other. So mm -hmm. the, the only the, the difference is the temperature. So the, the 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 level of stochastic excitation in the two channels is different. Okay. Uh, this is the physical embodiment of this. You have Nyquist Johnson noise here and Nyquist Johnson noise there. So you can represent this with some, some uh, white noise here mm -hmm. and, and white noise there okay. with different amplitudes, different, okay. uh, you know. That, that's an embodiment of, of this, this model. Okay. So, so uh, is, is this, uh, I, I guess I was trying to understand uh, the uh, assumption of independence are that it's reflected directly in, in the so, picture here. Right, so th think about a spring yeah. that has two degrees of freedom. Oh, yeah, and okay. think that I'm shaking it in this direction a lot. Yeah, right, yeah. And I'm shaking in this direction very little. Oh, I see. Eventually the spring is going to, to have some motion there. And if you have many springs, they're going to have a station distribution. Okay. If you follow the mass that has two degrees of freedom, okay. the mass, each mass will be rotating okay. because here it's exciting a lot. And so when it gets lined up with this, this source it's going to be excited a lot. Mm -hmm. And then it will be drifting because of the potential. Mm -hmm. and, and there will be leakage of this energy into the other mm -hmm. direction. Right. And it's that leakage that you sit in between and you try to tap onto. Okay. And uh, the, the postulate in earlier paper was that you, you get a torque and this torque, you somehow should be able to, to get energy out of this. But what we do is we change the whole potential. In other words, we change the capacitances and we follow it in a way that we get maximum mm -hmm. uh, energy out of this for mm -hmm. a cycle. We create a cyclic engine. Mm -hmm. And the linkage to the isoperimetric problem is absolutely beautiful because you 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 really see, you know, that you you have a, thermod a thermodynamic manifold with a Riemannian structure, mm -hmm. and an area means workout, mm -hmm. and path means dissipation. The shorter the path, the better off you are. Right. But if you have a very short path, of course, you don't get much out. Right. So you have to, to look at a compromise between those things. Okay. And of course, the time that it takes to go around. So you can play this in many different ways. Mm -hmm. I haven't, you know, you can look at the papers and, and, and you can see a lot more as to how you can squeeze useful information out of this. But I took the opportunity to ask the <laughs> person. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Any more questions from uh, online or from the in-room audience? Andrew, uh, Jordan here. Yeah, I have a few questions about the same model. So if you go back a slide to your circuit, uh, so you have a harmonic potential, but I would have thought if you have a harmonic potential, you would have inductors as well. If you just have capacitors and resistors, you just get exponential decay. 
So, so why don't you have inductors to get a harmonic motion? Actually, we're working on that. <laughs> you ask a very right, the right question. Yes, we're, we're asking, we're working on various embodiments of this to add inertia to it. I'll, I'll be delighted to discuss this when I come to Irvine. Okay, great. There, there is a lot more in this. This is some, again, this, this is some, the whole idea of gyrator goes back to Filiger and Reimann and, and relates also to things going even further back. But, but um, I don't think this is by any means the end of it. So, so the other question, or, or maybe it's a, it relates to the part of your talk where you got information, uh, is, that, is that there are other, these, these other Brownian particle engines where the control is not that you change the spring constant of your spring of your potential, but rather you change the origin of the potential. So you shift the potential over as your control. Have you thought of that kind of control? You could, you could, yes, you could do both. And, and most of those are very simplified engines. Uh, they, they are really in principle. Exactly what would be the right embodiment is, is uh, you know, and, and what is good. And again, it's, um, yeah, I mean, the jury is still out as to what would be the, the right thing and how many different things you can, you can do. You can do higher dimensions. You can also uh, look at this as a template and look at in nature, how nature works, you know, how, um, you know, um, different biological processes tap onto the differential in chemical potentials. Um, yeah, and I guess the last question I had is, is that usually with this kind of circuit to, to, get, to get work out, you put in some nonlinear element. You put in some diode or something like that, and here I guess uh, the role of your time dependence of your of your potential, I guess, is playing the role of the nonlinearity. Is that right? The fact that explicit time dependence. Well, uh, it's not really a nonlinearity. It's not, um, you know, in in well, in principle, of course, you have to to measure things. You have to. It's, it's still ways from being implemented. And I'll, I'd, I'd love to discuss more about aspects.